The coconut analogy. Anyone who is vaguely familiar with the social streamer Vosh has likely heard this analogy several times before. The first time I ever heard Vosh use this analogy was with his debate with Bastia, a progressive capitalist, on the capitalism versus socialism debate. For some context, Bastia and Vosh were debating ways for developing countries to adopt socialism, industrialize, and eventually challenge the United States and install a global social revolution. Vosh stated that protectionist policies for those developing nations, like Bolivia, were a good strategy to industrialize without being reliant on the capitalist West. However, Vosh claims that the World Bank coerced these developing countries into falling in line with the capitalist West. For even more context, the World Bank is an international financial bank. Their sister organization, the International Monetary Fund, or IMF, offers loans and funds to poor developing nations. What does the IMF demand in return for these loans? Well, lots of things. But Vosh's specific hang-up is that they demand that these developing nations open up their economies to foreign trade to receive the aid. Yeah, and, and I mean, I guess to the extent that you think countries should be free to refuse IMF loans, I mean, sure, well, they should, should be free hope. to refuse IMF loans, yeah. as they always have been, right? That's never been, like, there are conditions countries may find themselves in where an IMF loan is a lot better than the alternative, but but the IMF loan is... This is what I mean about points. coercion, though, Bastia. Yeah, if a country and, and is, if a country is that, desperately poor... Because of war and civil conflict, right. and then the IMF yeah. shows up and they're like, we'll give you $100 million yeah. as long as you yeah. neoliberalize your economy. This is a coercive right. engagement, yeah. is it not? Well, I don't believe there's any fundamentally coercive element to like war-torn, poor, ravaged countries with desperate yeah. populations being offered loans as long as they're right. willing to succumb to Western business interests. If you don't think that's an right. interaction which has okay. some degree of, of coercion, of implicit force behind it, then I don't know what you're even talking about. Here's where Vosh brings up the coconut analogy. You fly a plane, plane, cr well, you're not flying. Plane crashes, desert island. You wake up, yeah. but somebody else, the only other survivor, woke up before you. Yeah. And they have collected all the coconuts, the only sure. food sources on the island. They have them, right. they're theirs now. And they say they'll provide you coconuts so long as you suck their dick. Now, the only yeah. question is, do you consider this a coercive exchange? So the question is, if I and a passenger land on a desert island, and the passenger gathers all the coconuts on the island, then says that the only way for me to have some of the coconuts is if I suck his dick, is that coercive? Am I being coerced in that scenario? If that is coercive, then the way that the International Monetary Fund demands free trade to developing nations for foreign aid is as well. In addition to the relationship between employer and employee, etc, 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 socialism time. Well. This analogy is very, very flawed, so let's unpack this. As a preface, Vosh is a master of rhetoric. He is like a well-oiled machine designed to make the dumbest, most inaccurate, and fallacious arguments seem profound. This is seen in the way he speaks, his tone of voice, and his word choice. If you find yourself being compelled by one of Vosh's arguments, repeat his statement in your head, but in a less condescending voice. Chances are, it will likely not be nearly as pervasive as originally thought. The rhetorical and optical mastery is seen in his coconut analogy. Bosch's analogy seems to be perfectly calibrated to combine several different rhetorical layers to win over the audience, with the first layer being the social stigma of sex. Think of it like this, there's a reason why in America, prostitution has been decriminalized in less states than black tar heroin. We see sex as something sacred, and we therefore have a huge social stigma when it comes to treating sex like any other service or commodity. Therefore, by giving his coconut analogy the rhetorical stigma of sex, we are far more likely to see Vosch's coconut analogy as coercive. This would be all good if Vosch was using this analogy to sexual exchanges, but he doesn't. In all of my time watching Vosch, I have never heard him use the coconut analogy towards any type of sexual exchange. He has only used it in terms of traditional capitalist trade like trade between employer or employee, or trade between different nations. Therefore, because his analogy has never been used in a sexual context, this aspect of it is unnecessary to the analogy's general point. The sexual aspect is not a logical layer, but a rhetorical one. So let's change this analogy somewhat to remove that sexual aspect. You and me crash land on a desert island. I wake up before you, and in the meantime, I claim all the coconuts from the coconut trees and put it in my pile. I then say that I will give you some of the coconuts if, and only if, you gather some bark from the trees for a fire. Is this relationship coercive? Most of you would be less likely to say yes, 
as you can see, removing that one rhetorical layer makes all the difference already. But most Marxists will still claim that such an exchange is coercive. Let's continue. So a, t a kid has a certain grade, not kid, let's say college, okay? Let's yeah. say a college student has a certain grade and the teacher kind of suggests, you know, that if they stay after class and make some amends, that maybe the grade right. will go up, but they don't demand anything. They don't pull out a gun. They don't threaten anything. Is that not coercion in a comparable way? Well, I would say yeah. it's coercion yeah. because the teacher yeah. has- You're coercion. okay with teachers- No, Vosh, I'm not okay with that. No, and but again, that's the what the question you... was. <laughs> college, yeah. so you think it's okay if it's college? No, it's not okay for a variety of reasons, but it's not like coercion. Wait, I don't then, agree with wait that. if it's not for coercion, reasons, then what about it is wrong? We don't, we don't. Vosh, when discussing this analogy, plays a lot of semantic games with the idea of coercion. Vosh doesn't understand how an exchange can not be coercive, but still be bad. Let's give an example of this semantic game. Let's say I break into your house at night, steal all of your belongings, shit in your toilet, throw your baby out of your window, and frame you for the JFK assassination. Now let's say I do all of that. Did I rape you? The correct answer is obviously no. While I did a lot of really bad things, I never did anything close to rape. However, in a debate format like Vosh's, despite you being factually correct, I would win lots of optical and rhetorical points with the audience, as you would come off as unreasonable. It is the same thing with Bastia, and with a college professor offering sex for a higher grade to an adult college female student. Firstly, this analogy is also reliant on a sexual stigma. If we replace sex with, I don't know, going on a field trip or doing an extra homework assignment, the argument would fall apart. But even then, Basiat is correct in saying that two fully grown conscious adults trading sex for higher grades is not a course of exchange. It's simply undesirable as something can be bad without being technically coercive. However, he comes off as unreasonable, as Vosh plays semantic games by conflating any interaction that is ever undesirable with coercion. Let's rephrase this analogy to include this distinction. You and me crash land on a desert island. I wake up before you, and in the meantime, I claim all the coconuts from the coconut trees and put them in my pile. I then say that I will give you some of the coconuts if and only if you gather some bark from the trees for a fire. Is this relationship not only undesirable, but also coercive? As you can see, by removing these two elements of his analogy, the sexual aspect and the semantic aspect, any revelations about the nature of coercion now fall flat on their face. In fact, all that Vosch's analogy demonstrates here is that monopolies can kind of suck. The third rhetorical layer comes from its extreme misrepresentation of monopolization and the modern economy in general. Firstly, his analogy contains the fixed pie fallacy, the belief that there is a fixed amount of wealth in the world. It is the idea that under a capitalist economy, when one person gets richer, another must get poorer. If one person acquires more coconuts, that means less for everyone else. However, wealth is constantly being created and destroyed. If I chop down a tree for lumber, for example, I've just created more wealth. If I take that lumber and whittle into a chair, I've just created more wealth as well. But if I throw that chair into a fireplace, I've just left the world with less wealth than when I started. In almost every single economy in human history, this fallacy remained a fallacy. Only in Vosch's analogy, in which there is only one industry, one mode of production for that industry, a fixed amount of product in that industry, and only two consumers to buy from that industry, is this fallacy even remotely applicable? Only in industries that sell a fixed natural resource, a minority of industries by the way, is this the case. And even then, under capitalism, there are countless possible industries to be created and invented to act as an alternative to that industry. For example, if we started to, say, run out of oil, oil companies wouldn't say, all right, now anyone who wants a barrel now has to suck our dick, no. What would happen instead would be an increased demand for alternatives like nuclear, solar, wind, and etc., and increased opportunities for entrepreneurs to invent new forms of alternative energy. If we started to run out of iron, or if a company started to monopolize the iron industry, entrepreneurs would simply invent stronger and cheaper alternatives. Whenever monopolies or cartels form in any industry and act in the ways Vosch's coconut monopoly acts, they are almost always broken up as quickly as they are formed. From Thomas Sowell's Basic Economics, even in the rare case where a GMO monopoly exists on its own, that is, has not been created or sustained by government policy, 
The consequences in practice have tended to be much less dire than in theory. During the decades when the Aluminum Company of America was the only producer of virgin ingot aluminum in the United States, its annual profit rate on its investments was about 10% after taxes. Moreover, the price of aluminum went down over the years to a fraction of what had been before the Aluminum Company was formed. Yet, the Aluminum Company was prosecuted under the antitrust laws and convicted. Why were the aluminum prices going down under a monopoly when, in theory, they should have been going up? Despite its quote-unquote control of the market for aluminum, the aluminum company was well aware that it cannot jack up prices at will without risking the substitution of another material, steel, tin, wood, plastics, from aluminum by many users. Technological progress lowered the cost of producing all these materials and economic competition forced the competing firms to lower their prices accordingly. This raises a question which applies far beyond the aluminum industry. Percentages of the market controlled by this or that company ignored the role of substitutes that may be officially classified as products of other industries, but which can nevertheless be used as substitutes by many buyers, if the price of the monopolized products rises significantly. Whether in a monopolies or a competitive market, a technologically very different product may serve as a substitute, as television did when it replaced many newspapers as sources of information, and entertainment when smartphones that could take pictures provided devastating competition for the simple and expensive cameras that had long been profitable for Eastman Kodak. Phones and cameras would be classified as being in separate industries when calculating what percentage of the market was controlled by Kodak, but the economic reality said otherwise. Also, rarely ever in history, when government is not involved, do monopolies form through dumb luck, like the coconut monopoly in Vosh's analogy. On Desert Island, the monopoly is formed because I simply woke up an hour before you. But in real life, monopolies are formed because the monopolists were expertly able to provide better goods and services to more people at a far lower price. A key economic fact that is missing in his analogy. When Andrew Carnegie founded the Carnegie Steel Company, it wasn't because he simply woke up an hour earlier to get all the coconuts really quick, it's because he invented the Bessemer process, which revolutionized the steel industry and was able to sell steel at a fraction of his competitors. Vanderbilt didn't get rich because of how many people he got to suck his dick, but because he revolutionized the entire overseas shipping industry and his economic prowess. I could go on, but the point is clear. A better analogy would be this. You and me crash land at a desert island. I wake up before you. In the meantime, I claim all the coconuts from the coconut trees and put it in my pile. You wake up and you set up a rain catcher with your coat and some palm trees. Or maybe catch crabs and fish in the water. Or use your cert to desalinate the seawater. We then trade coconuts for any number of these various goods. Is this relationship coercive? As we can see, by replacing Vosch's analogy with a better and more factual representation of real world monopolies, we are far less likely to see this relationship as coercive. In fact, many of us would see this relationship as desirable. In order to continue, we need to ask ourselves, what exactly about the coconut analogy does Vosh think is coercive? Surprisingly, it's not the quote-unquote work or starve aspect of it. Many Marxists claim that under capitalism, you have to work or else you will starve to death. Therefore, because it is fueled by the threat of death, capitalism is coercive. This reasoning is flawed, and I might cover it in another video, but Vosh's definition of coercion is, instead, a power imbalance. For example, Vosh would consider the relationship between an employer and an employee as coercive because the employer has power leverage over the employee. Other examples would be maybe a teacher yelling at a student for not doing their homework. That's a power imbalance. Or a more experienced worker arguing with a less experienced worker on how they should accomplish a certain task. Or an older child arguing with a younger child and who gets to play with a ball. To Vosh, all these relationships have power imbalances and are therefore coercive, though to different extents. If a worker doesn't get a job from a company, he would be forced to live in dire poverty. While if a company doesn't hire a worker, they would likely only feel a modest dent on their productivity and profits. Just on the coconut island, the man with coconuts holds an extreme power imbalance against the man without. If the man without the coconut refuses the trade, he will presumably starve. While the man with coconuts would simply have blue balls, or in our revised analogies, cold balls. So let's look at this a little more. Does defining coercion as any power imbalance actually hold up to scrutiny?
You are an unemployed worker, let's say, and you apply for a job. The bargaining between you and the employer has a power imbalance, as if you don't get hired, you will face potential homelessness and poverty, while the employer would simply be down a pair of hands. This relationship has a power imbalance and is presumably coercive. Okay, let's change the analogy a little bit. Let's say you're already employed and receive a comfortable middle class income. Now, let's say a big labor shortage strikes your community. And now business owners are finding it really, really hard to keep their companies running. One neighboring company has had all of their staff quit and has been unable to find any replacements due to the labor shortage. Say you go to this business owner and you apply for a job and demand a higher wage than you received already at your old job. Well, before it would be the employer with the unfair power imbalance. Now it is you, the worker. If the business owner refuses, they will lose their entire business while the worker will simply return to his comfortable middle-class income. If we are able to define power imbalances as a form of coercion, then the worker in this scenario is coercing the business owner, a fact that may be uncomfortable to many socialists. This revelation that a power imbalance can work in reverse may seem minor until we take a closer look. Remember again what Bosch's solution to the worker's power imbalance was. It was unionization of the workers. Coercion is, well, you have explicit and implicit coercion. And explicit coercion, I think, would be like bullet to the head, like gun to the head, like, you know, very yeah. obvious. But implicit coercion is when there is a power balance or a power imbalance, I'm sorry, between two or more entities, which means that there's not really a way to fairly dictate the terms of an engagement between them. An example of this would be unionization. The reason we have unions is because collective bargaining is the only way that workers can actually yeah. like barter for their salaries up next to a corporation. Unions work because through collective bargaining, you're able to bolster yourself. You're able to make yourself stronger. And that's the way you make that interaction more fair. Sure. Only through unions can we even arrive at what a capitalist would consider a fair wage for a worker. Because otherwise, by having collective bargaining, the power imbalance between an employer and an employee is offset, eliminating its coercive nature. Vosch views a power imbalance as always morally wrong and therefore believes in collective bargaining. However, what should then happen during an extreme labor shortage in which the power balance shifts dramatically in favor of the workers as seen in the above analogy? What should happen then? If we were to say that power imbalances are always coercive and morally wrong, then would it logically follow that during an extreme labor shortage, businesses should form cartels to prevent a coercive relationship with their workers. The existence of these cartels would not only be moral, but would allow for a fair, less coercive relationship between workers and capitalists, at least according to this absurd moral principle. I doubt that Vosh, or any self-described socialist, would feel comfortable advocating for businesses to form cartels in any scenario, which demonstrates that they don't hold the standard either. But if you're not convinced by this, let's look at another example. The idea that power imbalances and exchanges are not only bad, but coercive, can be disproven by looking at well, real life. When I was younger, whenever my parents needed a large project or chore done in the house, like mowing the lawn or moving in heavy furniture, instead of hiring professional laborers or making my 10-year-old self do it, they would sometimes go to a nearby homeless shelter and offer uh, someone $50 or so for their help, sometimes more if the job ended up taking the entire day. While some people were hesitant, almost all of them were incredibly grateful for the opportunity. They saw my parents' offer as compassionate. Even my 10-year-old self could recognize that what my parents were doing was good. But when I saw these interactions, I'll tell you the last thing that came to my mind. The last thing that came to my mind was, oh my god, my parents are literally coercing these people. The power imbalances between these two individuals is so unfair and wrong. No, absolutely not. That was also probably the last thing that came to my parents' mind as well and absolutely the last thing that probably came to the minds of the beggars who were grateful for the opportunity and the job. Such a ridiculous principle like that falls apart like a house of cards when looked at closely. If you don't think this is a valid example, think about it a little bit more. If the homeless person doesn't accept, they will go hungry for days. My parents will simply have to do the chores themselves. In fact, based on this ridiculous moral principle, any attempt for a business to reach out and employ the less fortunate would technically be seen as coercive in Vosh's eyes. There's a clear power imbalance here, yet you would have to be the most deranged of leftists to seriously argue that offering work to a homeless person would be a coercive relationship.
A better coconut analogy would be the following. You and me crash land at a desert island. I wake up before you, and in the meantime, I claim all the avocados from the avocado trees and put it on my pile. I, however, don't have any nails to peel the skin off while well, you do. When you wake up, I offer to share half the avocados with you, but only if you use your nails to peel their skin. Is this relationship coercive? If you're objecting to this analogy right now, it adds every single fundamental aspect of Bosch's analogy. The power imbalance is evidently clear. If you don't accept, I will have to eat the avocados with the skin on, while you have to starve to death. Someone who is at risk of starvation will be powerless against someone who is simply at risk of eating avocado peels. Yet, when we strip away the rhetorical fluff of the analogy, the sexual aspect, the semantic play, and the inaccurate depiction of monopolies, and solely look at the fundamental logical argument, it simply falls in its face. The power imbalance is not inherently immoral, nor is it coercive. And here, I want to bring back the original topic the analogy was used for, foreign trade, the International Monetary Fund, and coercion. Firstly, Bosch's contention was that the International Monetary Fund gave loans to developing countries in exchange for them to open their borders to trade. However, actually look at this deal for a second. When taking into account that free trade with foreign countries has been proven to be one of the best ways to lower poverty in developing nations and allow them to gain wealth, a pattern that has been seen with Ghana, Ireland, Colombia, Vietnam, along with countless other African, Asian, and European countries, and the fact that these developing countries are literally paid to adopt these exceptional free trade models. It's it's the equivalent of offering to suck someone's dick in order to gift them a coconut. And secondly, what does Vosh honestly think the IMF should do in this situation? Should the International Monetary Fund lift up their hands and say, sorry developing countries, sorry poor starving masses, some fat grifter on the internet told us they have to give you aid, it would be coercive. I mean, what kind of aid could the IMF possibly provide to these countries that Vosh would not consider to be, in some way, coercive? What way could a business try to hire a homeless person to provide them a, a stable income and wage that wouldn't result in them being coerced? Think of the original coconut analogy. Despite its extreme flaws, this concept still applies. Would you rather the person with the coconuts lift up his hands and say, sorry buddy, not for sale? And if the IMF did lift up their hands and say, Sorry, no more funds for you. We can't coerce you anymore. Do you really think Vosh would celebrate? No, he and his socialist friends would use the move as an example of capitalism leaving billions of poor to starve to death. I mean, there's no winning with these people. And just to close out, I want you to imagine for a moment a real person living in a real third world country. It can be hard as we are so used to our lives in the West but truly imagine trying to live on a single dollar a day, living where running water is considered a luxury, and where diseases such as the flu and common cold are death sentences. Imagine this desperate poverty and the people living in it. Let's say someone offered these people with the possibility of jobs, the possibility of education, of wealth, and of opportunity. How many of these people's responses would be, wait, before you do this, imagine you crash landed on a desert island. I mean, it's... Vosh's analogy doesn't come off as profound. It comes off as obtuse, tone-deaf, and arrogant.